Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany had quite a turbulent life. He was born with a disabled left arm which would impact him for the rest of his days and is the reason why he is always somewhat hiding it in pictures. Immediately after becoming Kaiser, he entered a power struggle with the Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, which he would win. During his reign he got fascinated by the navy and attempted to compete with Britain for naval dominance. Around the turn of the century, he played a crucial part in the suppression of the Boxer Uprising in China. He was partly responsible for the outbreak of the First World War, during the course of which he had lost a significant portion of his power. All of the aforementioned aspects are quite well known to most who are interested in the history of the last German Emperor. One part of his life that often gets overlooked, however, are his final years in the Dutch exile. Just as the First World War was coming to an end, Wilhelm sought refuge in the Netherlands, where he would spend the rest of his life. Of course he didn't just sit back and do nothing during this time, but he conjured up plans on how he could get back into power. In this video we will take a look at why the Kaiser was forced to abdicate in the first place, and why he fled to the Netherlands, and what his plans to overthrow the Weimar Republic looked like. Before we start with the video, a huge thank you to MyHeritage, whom I've partnered with today. MyHeritage is the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. Researching where your own family came from can be really interesting and MyHeritage makes this incredibly easy for you. It also helps you to find relatives you didn't know about before who might have come from vastly different backgrounds. It's very simple to use as well. Just add the names and dates of birth of yourself, your parents and your grandparents and MyHeritage does the rest. The website automatically searches over 19 billion historical documents from all over the world and countless trees from other users to find out more information about your family members. For instance, it managed to find the eight siblings that my great-great-grandmother Theresa Margarete had. It also found out that my great-great-great-grandfather Franz had received the Prussian Merit Cross for war aid in World War I, which was very exciting to find out, to say the least. MyHeritage also has tons of other cool features like this one, which allows you to colorize old historical photos within mere seconds. I used our good friend Wilhelm as an example here and it just looks great. So, what are you waiting for? Click on the first link in my description where you can sign up for a 14 day free trial and enjoy all of the amazing features that MyHeritage has to offer. It was late September. 1918 in the small Belgian town of Spa where the German Supreme Army Command had been residing since March of the same year. After significant Allied victories in France and in the Balkans, which brought the German army to the brink of collapse, the generals Erich Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg had no choice but to admit defeat. To prevent a potential revolution and to deflect the blame away from them, Prince Max von Baden was appointed as the new Chancellor. Max von Baden's job was to form a new, more parliamentary government and to start peace negotiations with the American president. Kaiser Wilhelm II didn't take the news very well. His future looked bleak, as indeed did the prospect of an autocratic Germany led by a monarch. And so he stayed in bed for five days in the new palais in Potsdam and seriously considered abdicating. Even ultra-conservative monarchists like the former Prussian Minister of War, Karl von Einem, began to realize the hopelessness of their situation. He wrote to his wife, I don't believe that His Majesty will stay. We should be glad if the Empire stays as a whole. And indeed, the Kaiser could have just abdicated then and there before public opinion turned completely against him. However, Chancellor Max von Baden made a fatal mistake by downplaying the political situation during a visit to the Kaiser and by promising that his new cabinet would cover him. This led to Wilhelm II developing a last bit of, frankly delusional, hope that the monarchy was still salvageable, somehow. From that moment on, abdication was absolutely not an option for him anymore, whatever the price might have been. But at that point, most people just wanted him gone, because he directly stood in the way of peace. US President Wilson had made it very clear that he would only enter peace negotiations with a democratic German government, endorsed by its people, and not with a monarchy. Wilhelm's days as Kaiser were numbered. Wilhelm was furious and called the president an outrageous lout and a Bolshevist. On the 29th of October, he hastily travelled from Potsdam to Spa to escape the pressure that was tracking down on him. Hoping that the army would at least still be loyal to him, he planned to lead them to Berlin to shoot all the traitors who wanted him to abdicate. Even when the revolution began in Kiel just a few days later, 
Wilhelm refused to acknowledge the reality of the situation altogether and still planned to simply march in with his army. So essentially, he wanted to start a civil war. The revolution spread quickly and soon took control over most big German cities. In Bavaria, the Wittelsbach dynasty was dethroned and the same fate befell the other royal houses as well. On the morning of the 9th of November, a group of army commanders from nearby armies arrived in Spa and made it very clear that the troops were tired of fighting and completely demoralized. Wilhelm's plan was never going to work. He telegraphed to Berlin that he would abdicate as Emperor of Germany, but not as King of Prussia. But because the situation in Berlin was so urgent and chaotic, Chancellor von Baden simply announced that Wilhelm II would abdicate. A few hours later, Philipp Scheidemann proclaimed the Republic from a window in the Reichstag. This was a fait accompli. The monarchy was no more. The only thing Wilhelm could do was to flee, so as not to fall into the hands of revolutionary troops. General Wilhelm Gröner would later recall, he said nothing, just looked. Looked from one to the other with a look first of astonishment, then of pitying pleading, finally just of strange, vague dismay. He said nothing, and we led him away as if he were a small child and sent him to Holland. In the early morning hours of the next day, Wilhelm crossed the Belgian-Dutch border. The Dutch government approved granting him asylum in the Netherlands. For the time being, he was accommodated in the Amerongen castle near Utrecht, which belonged to Count Godard van Aldenburg Bentik. Soon the ex-Kaiser's wife, Auguste Victoria, and a few dozen servants arrived as well. During his time at Amerongen castle, Wilhelm refused to acknowledge any responsibility for the war or Germany's defeat. He often said that his conscience was clean, because our Lord knows that he never wanted this war. Instead, he blamed his former chancellors, ministers and generals. Never mind that he had been the highest commander in the German army, had encouraged the Austrian government to go through with their war plans against Serbia and would absolutely have had the authority to de-escalate the July crisis. He also claimed that he had been pressured to flee to Holland and that it hadn't been his personal decision. At least he acknowledged his abdication. On the 28th of November he declared, I hereby renounce the rights to the crown of Prussia and the associated rights to the German imperial crown for all future. So now, what did he do in his spare time? At Hammerongen he discovered a new hobby, wood chopping. Very much to the dismay of the castle's owner who feared for his tree population, Wilhelm often spent hours felling trees and chopping them into smaller logs. He justified this by saying that he needed exercise. It probably also helped him to calm down because the Allies were out for him. Article 227 of the Treaty of Versailles called for the Dutch government to hand over the Kaiser so that he could be tried for war crimes. This was done under the presumption that Germany was solely responsible for the First World War and because the Kaiser served as a symbolic figurehead of sorts. The Dutch government, however, made it quite clear that they were not going to surrender him. After a few months of slight diplomatic pressures, the matter was dropped by the Allies as the former Kaiser had simply lost all of his political importance. In the summer of 1919, the former Kaiser bought his own house in the village of Don. It was a small castle surrounded by a moat and came with an extensive park area. He completely renovated the castle, installed central heating and built a lift for his seriously ill wife. He also built a new gate at the entrance and set up electrical lanterns in the park. He could finance all this because the government in Berlin decided to release the assets of the Hohenzollern family. All the personal objects from the castles of Bellevue, Charlottenburg and Potsdam were written down on a list which encompassed a mere 71 pages. This included furniture, rare carpets, paintings, silver cutlery, tobacco tins that had belonged to Frederick the Great himself, two automobiles and a boat. In spring of 1920, around 68 train wagons loaded with personal belongings arrived in Utrecht from Germany. So, as you can see, Wilhelm didn't have to do without anything. The Prussian Ministry of Finance also transferred large sums of money to Don over the following years for the Kaiser to meet his cost of living. Considering that many ordinary people were suffering in Germany at that time, that was quite an absurd situation indeed. The former Empress, Auguste Victoria, didn't get to enjoy their new life for long. In April 1921, she died from her long-lasting illness, but not before uttering the wish to be buried in German soil. Her coffin was taken to Potsdam by train, where she was to be buried at the Sanssouci Palace. 
hundreds of thousands of people accompanied her procession from the train station to the palace. The funeral, which had been planned months before her death, was a massive spectacle, with officers saluting her and countless prominent figures like Hindenburg, Ludendorff, Tirpitz and of course the whole royal family being present. Wilhelm himself couldn't witness it as he was barred from entering Germany. His personal doctor noticed that the loneliness really weighed down on him and that he was visibly distraught about his loss. He needed a new soulmate and didn't need to wait long for an opportunity to arrive. About 18 months after the Empress's death, Wilhelm married Princess Hermine von Schöneich Karolat, a woman who was about 37 years younger than him. Apart from love, presumably, he also chose her for political reasons. By marrying a princess of equal status, he appeased many German monarchists who wanted to have a properly noble princess in case the couple ever returned onto the German throne. Hermine was also an ambitious and power-hungry person who would later establish several contacts to anti-democratic and revanchist elements of German society. In the second half of the 1920s, Wilhelm began to seriously increase his efforts of bringing his family back to the throne. Additionally, he also began to play with the thought of allying with much more authoritarian politicians. Previously, he had put most of his hopes into the monarchist and national conservative German National People's Party, as well as into Paul von Hindenburg, who had been elected as president in 1925. However, none of them had the re-establishment of the monarchy on their minds and even forbade members of former royal houses to set foot in Germany, should they pose a threat for the well-being of the Republic. Wilhelm, who very much intended to pose a threat for the well-being of the Republic, was furious and claimed that he could no longer rely on the aristocracy. As such, he began to be interested in the Völkisch movement, believing that he now needed a nationalist mass movement in order to regain power. Despite the fact that he wasn't allowed to engage in political activities, Wilhelm established contact with the ever-growing and consolidating anti-democratic associations in Weimar, Germany. His views also became increasingly nationalistic and extreme. For instance, he wrote a letter to the chairman of the agricultural associations in Köslin, Pomerania, in which he said, The common destiny of all Germans must bring them together to preserve their race. The symbol of this is the German fatherland, a state necessity for this is the monarchy. In another letter simply titled Instructions, which he sent to countless nationalistic organizations in Germany, he appealed to chauvinistic and anti-democratic sentiments and attempted to sway them to rise up against their hated democracy. What our fallen comrades have died for, we, the living, have to fight for. 1. For German freedom. 2. For the German dream. 3. Always for German honor. Only in this way are we worthy of our brothers who died before the enemy. Only then will they not have fallen in vain. The community of destiny unites all Germans throughout the world into a cohesive whole for the defense and preservation of their Germanic race. Its foundation is the German fatherland, its symbol the German emperor. His wife Hermine extensively traveled through Germany and met with representatives from anti-democratic movements and lobbied for a restitution of the monarchy. During the late 1920s, however, a certain group became very interesting to Wilhelm and the Hohenzollern family, the NSDAP. Wilhelm's youngest son, August Wilhelm, joined the party in 1930 and Hermine participated in the Nuremberg Rally of 1929. The reason for why Wilhelm agreed to collaborate with the NSDAP, despite the very stark difference in ideology, was that they shared a common goal, destroy the Weimar Republic and crush the socialists. The previously monarchist German National People's Party had changed their course and the possibility of bringing the monarchy back in a legal way seemed completely out of reach. Collaborating with the National Socialists seemed to be the most promising option. Due to the networking skills of Hermine and a few of Wilhelm's close associates, contact to some higher-ups in the Nazi party was established. In 1931 and 1932, Hermann Göring visited Dawn and hopes were high that the NSDAP would support him. Hermine even met with Adolf Hitler in November 1931. Later, however, the initial hopes were shattered when Hitler claimed that Wilhelm and the Crown Prince would be rejected by the masses. Wilhelm was furious and sent a letter to his son in which he tore the Nazis apart. When Göring found out about this letter, two of Wilhelm's employees attempted to make him sign an apology letter. 
Wilhelm completely refused to do so, saying that he would stick to his letter. He realised that the Nazis never intended on bringing the Kaiser back into power. When the NSDAP won the elections of March 1933, Hitler officially stated that the topic of restoring the monarchy was a complete taboo. The matter was wiped off the table when the Nazis outlawed all monarchist organisations in Germany in 1934. A partnership with Hitler was never going to work. Before 1933, the Nazis had hoped to at least gain some legitimacy by associating with the old ruling family. But when they rose to power, they no longer required that sort of legitimization and thus simply annulled the partnership. Wilhelm didn't consider collaborating with the NSDAP because he liked their ideology very much either. He did it for self-centered reasons, hoping that they would help him get back into power. One question that often comes up when talking about Wilhelm's relationship with the Nazis is, was he a convinced anti-Semite? There is some disagreement over this with historians. There is the British historian John Röhl, who became famous for his biography of the Kaiser in three volumes. He argued that Wilhelm held a very strong contempt against Jewish people and that he was sort of a precursor to Adolf Hitler. Others, like Christopher Clark, who also wrote a biography on Wilhelm, were not so convinced. He argues that Wilhelm did share a lot of the anti-Semitic prejudices that other German elites also held at the time. While reigning over Germany, Wilhelm II fostered close relationships with influential Jewish figures, including shipbuilder Albert Berlin, banker Max Warburg and coal tycoon Eduard Arnhold, among others. This small circle of Jewish associates became known as the Kaiser Juden during that time. Wilhelm also ennobled seven Jews during his reign, a notable departure from his predecessors who had ennobled only two. This even earned him a lot of criticism from German nationalists and anti-Semites, who feared favouritism towards Jewish financiers over the traditional German nobility. Although the Kaiser occasionally expressed anti-Semitic sentiments, particularly when under pressure from the media, there is no evidence to suggest that he actively sought to restrict the freedoms of German Jews or engaged in discriminatory practices against them. Wilhelm's anti-Semitism increased when he had fled to Holland. As we have seen, he was completely incapable of self-criticism and often blamed others for his mistakes. And a conspiracy theory about a plot from the all-controlling Jews who brought about the fall of the monarchy was just too convenient. He was a man who had fallen from grace and now lived in some Dutch village with no real power. Ranting about the Jews was a way for him to blow off steam. Keep in mind, however, that he blamed pretty much everybody for everything at all times. The Americans, the French, the British, the Communists, the Freemasons, the Social Democrats and many more. In the words of Christopher Clark himself, in his recriminations, as in everything else, Wilhelm was opportunistic, self-serving and inconsistent. His repugnant comments on the Jews were too narrowly yoked to the labour of self-exculpation to cohere into a stable worldview or provide a plan for action. While Wilhelm might have held some anti-Semitic views, he was still absolutely shocked when he found out that the Nazis had followed through with their plans of erasing Jews from German society. Shocking, I know. After the November pogrom of 1938, where 1,400 synagogues were set on fire and hundreds of innocent Jews lost their lives, Wilhelm remarked, It's a disgrace what's going on at home now. Now it is high time for the army to intervene. It has put up with a lot. It must not go along with this under any circumstances. The old officers and all decent Germans must protest. But everyone saw this killing and burning and didn't lift a finger. Still, he never openly condemned the pogroms and still sympathised with anti-democratic movements. It's impossible to answer the question whether there had ever been any real chance of Wilhelm regaining the German throne. What can be said for certain is that Wilhelm pretty much squandered his opportunities by sympathising with the very far-right, anti-democratic and revanchist parties of Weimar Germany. What he could have done instead was to break with the old Prussian monarchist traditions and commit to the democratic cause. He could have aligned with democratic and anti-fascist parties. This wouldn't have increased his chances of re-establishing the monarchy, obviously not, but it would have morally rehabilitated the now infamous Hohenzollern family and would have contributed in preventing the Nazi dictatorship and subsequently the Second World War. Sadly, neither the Kaiser nor any of his family members were able to consider such a path due to their self-centered worldview. When the Second World War did break out, Wilhelm wholly sympathised with the German army as he hoped that they would redeem the humiliation of Versailles. 
He described the Blitzkrieg in Poland as splendid and the occupation of Denmark and Norway as a miracle of heaven. When the German army invaded the Netherlands in 1940, the British government offered Wilhelm to go into exile in England, together with the Dutch government. Wilhelm refused that offer, saying, I'd rather be shot in Holland than flee to England. I have no desire to be photographed with Churchill. Don Castle was occupied by German troops as well. Wilhelm loved this, as he was finally in the centre of attention again and could sign autographs for enthusiastic German soldiers and talk to them about the successes at the front. When France capitulated, shortly after, he was proud of himself, as he considered this to be his own work. The brilliant leading generals in this war come from my school. They fought under my command in the World War as lieutenants, captains or young majors. In June of 1941, Wilhelm died of old age. In his will, he stated that his last resting place should be a mausoleum in the Don Castle Gardens. He didn't want to be buried in German soil, as long as the country wasn't ruled by a monarch. On the 9th of June, he was laid to rest, accompanied by 36 family members, countless old friends like August von Mackensen and some representatives from the army. Arthur Seiss Inquart, the Reichskommissar of the occupied Netherlands, was also present. Wilhelm's coffin is still in Dawn to this day. If you want to visit Kaiser Wilhelm's last residence, you can easily do that. I did it myself last summer and I thought it was pretty interesting. You can walk through the park area for ages and enjoy the peaceful atmosphere. The entrance to the area is completely free as well. You can even go into the castle, where there is a museum nowadays. Unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about it because it was closed on the day that I visited. Bloody Mondays. The mausoleum is not publicly accessible, but it looks like this from the inside. So, should you ever find yourself in Utrecht, definitely consider going on a trip to Don. It's absolutely worth it. Anyway, that's all for today. As always, a big Dankeschön for watching and I hope you liked the video and learned something useful. If you did, a like and a subscribe would be much appreciated. I would like to give a huge and heartfelt shout out to my kind supporters over on Ko-Fi. A cup of tea, Tristan Kriegsmann, Ryan Leighton, Philipp Marchewka, Marius Gerling, the Grand Duke of Sealand, Luca Drohle, Wienwe and Nico. You are absolutely phenomenal. Have a very nice day and see you next time. And just to remind you, if you click on the first link in my description, you will get a 14-day free trial, which gives you access to all of my heritage's features and allows you to discover your family's history. So, sign up today.